Hey, good morning, Brent Abel. Jeff Jacklitz here. What's up, Jeffrey? Well, beautiful. another beautiful day. Yeah, well, beautiful day, even though it's uh, raining and windy and cloudy and gloomy. What the heck? I mean, it's my way of thinking it's a beautiful day. I can do whatever I want with that. That's right. It's it's a choice, right? And, and it is it is cloudy and gloomy and rainy and windy at both ends of the state today. Uh -oh. I'm, I'm in Napa right now, and you're still in the desert, and so we get to share the experience. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Anyway, so here we are this morning, gold ball hunting. We are here to talk about the realities of tennis. Oh and God! How it works, right? Yeah. All all Shawshank <laughs> all day. All day. So. Who are we talking to today? We're talking to uh, those senior players who are out there pursuing national titles. Right, right. Uh, pursue, pursuing getting through first and second rounds and maybe, you know, the next level trying to get into the 16s and quarters and then the next level getting over that hump. And each, Beautiful. each one is a definite yeah. rung on the ladder. They all have their own challenges. Uh, we're also talking to those USTA league players who are trying to get 3-0 to 3-5, 3-5 to 4-0. And climbing that ladder as well, that's that's their own personal gold ball would be cool. the next level of their rating. And then, um, you know, the Wednesday night crowd, gals, guys who, you know, play the three sets, they mix it up. And uh, maybe you're tired of uh, buying the wine or buying the beer every Wednesday night. So uh, we're talking Man. to them, too. Pressure. <laughs> Pressure. So and, yeah. and with that group, maybe could be my favorite group depending on when you ask me is that Wednesday night group of guys and gals and and really all you, I know I know I've been there all you want to do is you want to be the man every Wednesday or you want to be the woman every every Wednesday night so right I totally get it. yep so uh so anyway that's who we're talking to today and um if you've been listening and and you like what we're doing here you can also uh down below at lettusknow.com. Um, you can shoot us an Not email. Not lettusknow.com. At lettusknow at goldballhunting.com. At goldballhunting yes, I'm going to get this right. Eventually, it's, it's I'm going to get this right. No, it's, it's a mouthful. Um, yeah. Anyway, you can you can contact us, and uh, what we're doing is offering a free 10-minute coaching call um, with one of us or both of us. Um, but you got to identify one thing about your game that is just driving you to the edge. <laughs> it's driving you crazy. And and you're looking for some answers that so far you haven't been able to find, so maybe we can help you out with that. So feel free to uh, drop us a line and um, let us know. We can help you. Beauty. So, B, you're Yo. on the hot seat today. All right. All right? So now we're going to freeform it here really good. Okay. What do you want to talk about today? <laughs> Maybe you woke up in a in cold sweat last night dreaming about something and and it's like, "Oh my gosh, I got to I got to I got to tell Jeff, I got to tell the GBH players out there what uh, what's in my head." So, yeah, okay, good. What's rolling around? What's rolling around in there today? Well, let's see. If I do this a couple of times, you can probably <laughs> hear the clanking going on. Um, well, look, this is I mean, typically what we do is we do put each other in the hot seat and uh, um, and ask each other questions that we have no idea what's what, what I mean totally unscripted this one was to be totally transparent not totally <laughs> uh, unscripted because I did ask Jeff to sort of team me up today with uh, um, a question so the thing I want to talk about today is you and I recorded both of our personal stories yesterday yep mine was as a player Yours was as a coach in terms of that that whole transformation from zero to I'm not going to call it hero, but but zero to a lot of pain. Things weren't working out for me as a player, uh, and then sort of what I did to what what was the plan to try to get better? All the struggles, all the conflicts that I went right. through, and then what was the end result? And there was right. really two end results, and and. Um, you know, one was the external thing and one was really the internal. Uh, but part of that journey for me uh, as a player was, uh, as I described in my story, I'd spent about 18 months with, with Mr. Stowe and then I was no longer working with him because he was getting very sick. This right. was back in 19... Uh, uh, he, he got sick and then he eventually passed away in 1983. But right after I st stopped working with him, 
um, I was <laughs> I was at the Berkeley Tennis Club court court four, and uh, Bill, not Bill Cosby, <laughs> Bill Crosby, C R O S B Y, mm -hmm. uh, Tom's former assistant back in the forties and fifties, <clears throat> and a world class world class uh, doubles player. In his own right. right, he and Bobby right. per, he and Bobby Perez were incredible. They were ranked one, maybe, you know, maybe it was two in the country. I think in 1960, um, and I just remember as a kid growing up at the BTC watching Bill Crosby, never missing a return to serve in doubles, and just going, <laughs> I, I, I want to be like that guy. That's it. But but this one day I'm on court four and I'm still launching forehands and backhands all over the club. I mean, you know, people, it's like. You know, missiles are coming in. You can you can hear them coming in right. on other courts and children you know, running for cover. <laughs> incoming. <laughs> and so uh, he's walking from the back courts. There's that walkway that you know between court right. four and five of the BTC. I'm on court four. He's walking back, walking towards the clubhouse, and that and and finally he stops. Watch me hit hit, hit a few balls, and then there's a break in the play. And uh, he says, uh, or maybe it's a side change. He says. Uh, a couple things, and I said, "Yeah, God, I just, you know, I can't." Yeah, he says, "Look, you know, you've really done a great job with with working with Tom, and I've seen so much, so much improvement in your game, and you've been so diligent and so dedicated to working on the stuff. And I know that it's it's hard to understand some of you know some of Mr. Stowe's stuff, but you're at a point now where you've got to do just two things." And I was like so ready for, you know, the, the wisdom download. Right? Where's my wallet? You want my credit cards? Max out this card. Max right. out that card. I'll give you all the cash I've got. Here's my account number. And uh, he said, there's just two things you got to do. He says, number one, find the ball. And, and I said, find the ball. You mean like, like watch the ball? And he said, well, any way you want to say it to yourself, but you got to find the ball. I mean, if you're if you're being distracted by anything else, like the guys hit a ball to you and you're watching him, or you're sort of got everything in your peripheral, and you haven't really found the ball, right? Then then you're not doing it. so. Find the ball, and once you find it, I, and he said, and here's the thing too: decide where you're going to send it next, not how you're going to send it, but where right. you're going to send it next. And I right. said. Uh, you know, I, w w once again, never being the sharpest tool in the shed when, 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 you know, mentors are dispensing information to me, I said, that's it. And uh, he said, <laughs> he said, that's it. That's it. If you'll do that, you will, you will start automating your strokes. You won't have to be thinking about how to manufacture and all the stuff right. you've been working on. And uh, you'll start to be able to play. You'll kind of relax and be able to play. And so, uh, for me, that was a huge moment in my journey from going from crap to not bad. <laughs> to not crap. <laughs> to, to not total crap. And uh, because it was sort of that moment where I realized that, that the better players, like Bill Crosby, who I'm telling you, this guy was an incredible player. And he had, he had Stowe down. The technique was Perfect, and it was the way that Tom Stowe wanted the game played. Cleaner than a whistle, completely on balance. The ball had a different sound. Right. It just did <laughs> boom, and I said, he's not doing much, but wow, that's loud over there. Right. And so to me, it was a big epiphany in terms of better players don't actually go through that checklist of trying to manufacture their strokes. Right. They actually trust that whatever they've worked on, all the practice sessions, it's there. It's totally there. And then the only two things they have to be conscious about is finding the ball. <clears throat> right. Which, especially for me, when I find the ball, now at this age, it's not, it's not totally sharp visual acuity when it's right off the racket. A little fuzzy, and as it gets closer, <laughs> it starts to come into focus. But really, for right. me, it's that last, I don't know, 10 feet. 20 feet, I don't know what it is. Right. It's, that, it's, that, it's a that number. That 20 feet is unbelievably critical. Right. And so when I focus on that, the second part 
for me uh, in terms of where are you going to send it has already been determined. I already right. know. I already, I already sense that's sort of that's so intuitive for me. But I right. still, I still, as I'm playing my shot, I'm still committed to that. To that, where am I going to send it next? And and I've really, for me, I've had to add a third element. Yeah. And and that is, I naturally do this on my on my slice backhand, and that is to keep my my head still, my eyes soft, and and my vision, just just laying it there on the point of contact as the racket goes, and on my topspin backhand pass, on my forehand slice or topspin forehand, and on my serve, on my volleys, everything else in my game. I have to artificially do what I see Fed do, right. which is I have to just, if I'm topping the, the backhand for, for a pass, I have to go, okay, right. okay. And when yeah. I do that, that's what it feels like, but it's like just a moment and boom, and then and then I'm back. So, right. So, um, yeah, I think I, that, that's, that's a really you know critical understanding of the moment of uh, you know receiving the ball. And I think you know what you're describing there. Um, I first heard it um, a few years ago, maybe more than a few now, um, at a conference. And I'm going to give credit where credit is due here to the term anyway of receiving and sending. So Mark Fairchild is, you know, you know, Mark, he right. was giving a, he was giving a, uh, you know, a, a little seminar and, um, and I, and I thought, wow, what a great, uh, what a great description of the moment of producing the stroke, but not letting that production get in the way of seeing the ball and where am I going to send it? So <clears throat> I've taken that and the way I describe it to my students is you know, receiving and sending. So I describe it this way. If you've ever watched a Major League Baseball game and there's a hot grounder to the shortstop and the batter is like one of the all-time, you know, it's Ricky Henderson, right? The all, one of the all-time great base stealers, right? The guy's just lightning fast. Ricky himself would cause the error because he's so fast because the, the shortstop or the second baseman... <laughs> Right before they receive the ball, head comes up and they're looking to see where Ricky is in his quest for first base. So now they haven't secured the ball and they're looking and now they fumble with the ball a little bit and they make an errant throw because they were never in receive mode. They were always in send mode because of Ricky's uh, reputation, right? He's just so fast. So, so in tennis, what happens is we get going and you can watch, you, you watch players do this. That guy is always in send mode, which means everything's happening out there somewhere. In, Hold and, on and, for one second. I have to write this down. <laughs> send mode. I like this. Hold on. Just a second. I'm here. I know you're there. Um, I'll wait. Send mode. Uh, I guess it'll be on this one here. Okay. All right. Send mode. Good. All right. Continue, Jeffrey. That's very good. So, so, the, so w when we cut off the receive end of it, we're not really dialed into the ball. So what you're describing, you know, um, from what you got from Bill was the receive the ball. Yeah. And that means, and that means there's a moment where, you know, you're on a balanced platform it, and it doesn't mean that your footing is, let's say, uh, tennis theory, you know, correct per se, you know, it's, it's, am I balanced? Am I on a platform that allows me to produce the stroke? Meaning could be one foot, could be open stance, could be closed stance, could be any, any combination of those things. But have I, have I received the ball? Am I dialing it in as it's coming in so that my stroke naturally starts to start at the right time? My footing naturally starts to settle at the right time. And then I'm patient enough to let the ball come into my framework to make an easy that that the production value of the stroke becomes easy. I'm not fighting all the other forces because I am so out here. I'm constantly in send mode and send mode. When you're in that mode, you are constantly out in front of the ball. Um, well, having to manufacture stuff. The timing is just horrific. I mean, and it, it, just, it gets it gets frustrating. Yeah. Well, and and you're not confident. You're you're not showing no. a sense of confidence. When I watch Fed when he does this. It's like this, this supreme confidence that I don't have to, 
I don't have to look. I don't have to see what my result is. I don't have to see where the guy is over there until I feel like in my time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and finish the swing. I remember working with Michael Wayman uh, back in 2008, <clears throat> when our, our favorite Brit, lefty little yes. red guy yes. just yes. like a little he's that little bulldog on your on your on your pants yeah, just... that you're trying to shake it and it just won't yeah. go away it just will not stop dog with dog with a bone oh dog God. with a bone man he and, won't let go <laughs> but one of my all-time favorite guys and he really helped me with um it was my first national singles title which was in 2009 60 hard courts and we worked for about six months on primarily one shot, which was I would get a short ball to my backhand. I wanted to play a slice backhand up the line. And even though I said before, that usually for me is a pretty, is naturally, instinctively, I can sort of keep my head down on that. But on that shot, I was, I was, I was peaking a little bit too early. And, and some right. of it was because I was thinking out into the future. Just that nanosecond right. out in the future, I was thinking... I was thinking of all the th possibilities that could happen. Well, maybe right. the guy right now, because I'm not looking out there, I'm looking down at the ball. Maybe he's already going over there. Maybe he's going to be sitting there. And when I look up, it's going to be, boom, the ball's by me. And so I better stick a little better. And, right, right. And, uh, so, that always works out, trying to hit it a little bit better. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think that, I think, and I don't know why we do this, I mean, we could, that would be a deep dive in some kind of a shrink's office. But, right. but you know, why do we peak? Well, for me, the reason that I take a little, you know, peak is because I don't, I don't 100% trust that that where I'm going to play it is is actually going to get there. And right. secondly, I don't trust that that I've got time um, to not get ready right now. Right. For, for whatever could happen. And so when, when to me, the peaking is really all about I didn't do thing one that Bill Crosby gave me is I didn't visually find the ball. I, I just didn't visually have a tight last 20 feet lock on it. And number two, I wasn't 100 percent committed to well, where am I now going to send the ball? Where are you going to send it? Right. And that's when that's when I start. That's when I start peaking. So for me, it is that third element of of making sure that I artificially, it's got to be artificial. It's not natural for me. Well, like you know the, what? I think, I, I think that's interesting. Uh, is to keep you know, everything that, down and just, just yeah. not, just not look up. Well, I, I and think, even, you know, even on the surf, I mean, I've got to do this up here. Right. You know, so. Absolutely. I, I think, um, you know, watching the ball is a skill set. It, that's it's because we, we naturally, you know, as human beings, we, you know, a bird flies over and we naturally, you know, we look. You know, squirrel. You know, whatever you want. You know, you know, whatever you want to call it. But we naturally want to track things, and and we get distracted very easily. And I think you know, for our players out there, it is something you have to practice. It it is a skill set to keep your head steady on the ball through contact. It, it's some players do it maybe more naturally than other players, but still, it requires attention, specific attention, like as you're describing, artificially. Because you, all of a sudden you will have a different sensibility of the ball and the strings. You, that, that feel of the ball and the strings will actually be heightened when you focus on that moment of contact and realize, wow, that, that felt a little different. It felt, it felt more comfortable because the ball was maybe just a fraction a little farther back in the strike zone where, where your framework and your body, all that was working together. Um, it's, not, it's not these separate parts and pieces, you know. So it is, you know, I, I, I sometimes I'll throw, you know, the golf – golf analogy in there too is that you know if you've ever hit a golf ball <clears throat> you swing you hit and your head's there and then you then you look up and the ball's 20 30 yards out in front of you if if you've made contact right well i've but made contact mine just going do right yeah you know. yeah wherever it's going uh -huh. but but that sensibility of of i gotta hit the ball first and then i'm gonna look up and we naturally just see it we naturally just track it oh it's right there so um, I know there's been studies on Fed's ball, you know, and I think the ball is, the ball is about 15 feet out in front of him after contact when he visually picks it up. Well, that's pretty I mean, that's quick. A, it's pretty soon. Yeah. It's pretty darn soon. Good, good. Well, listen, um, thank you for letting me ask myself <laughs> the question today. 
guys, uh, I think we're going to shut this one down. Um, I guess a couple of things. Number one is just as Jeff uh, said in the beginning at the top of today's episode of goldballhunting.com is we are offering a free 10 minute coaching call. If there's one thing on your plate right now that you've just not been able to figure out, or maybe it's something that you and your teaching pro are struggling with. And we certainly don't want to, we don't want to, well, maybe we do. Maybe we do. <laughs> Yeah. We want to stir the pot just well, a little bit. No, we actually want to. <laughs> no. We want to. We want to help you solve that thing. Um, and so, again, a, t- a free ten-minute coaching call can be either with one of us individually, or can be with me and Jeff. We can do a three-way call. Uh, it's free. All you have to do is just uh, send an email to let us know at goldballhunting.com, and um, and we'll get we'll find a time that's uh, that's convenient for you. Jeffrey, at this point, we are going to ask them to do a few things. A few things. Yes. Like us. Like us. Share us. Subscribe to us. <laughs> the, the Would you stop peeking? In. It's like you're peeking on these. Peeking, on, right? And then, uh, and then, you know, then let us know what you think. You know, make a comment down there, and um, and we love to hear from you. Awesome, awesome, guys. <laughs> get out there, make it a spectacular day. Help someone else do the same thing. And Jeffrey, we will do this again tomorrow. Can't wait.